Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very sorry for the delay. Um, Dr. Kuhora is going to join in a few. In the meantime, um, Marcy and Mary, I don't know, can you raise your hand so that I can upgrade you uh, as a panelist? But before he joins us in, uh, maybe I, I introduce you because you've taken your sweet time, to, uh, uh, kind time and consideration to join us in and uh, quite timely. Um, Masi is one of the actorals uh, who work tire tirelessly behind uh, developing the benefit package that Dr. Kohoro has been explaining. Um, just maybe in a short way, can you give us a picture? We've always heard of actual science and, and what have you. Can you explain to us how you come into and how you bring your expertise into the health insurance, especially the social health insurance? Um, thank you, Amina. Maybe I'll just take one or two minutes to explain how we come in uh, before Dr. Kohara starts the presentation. Um, so as actuaries, basically, we look at mostly probability. Um, and in this case, even as we design the benefit package, what we're looking at is what do we expect the population to spend? How many people do we expect to spend for a particular disease? And then now we take all that and calculate. Basically, we're looking at severity, average cost of claim, and the frequency of people visiting the hospitals. So once you get all that, then we come up with the cost, or rather with what we expect to spend as a health insurance. Then from that, we also look at what do we expect to, to get from contributions in terms of contribution. Now, after looking at all that, there's what we call the loss ratio. So for the fund to be sustainable, there's a certain um, there's a certain loss ratio that we're supposed to attain. Currently, as an HF, we look at 85%. Um, for sure, it will be higher than that because we expect to pay out more um, than what we are paying out now. Um, so we look at all those aspects, the health seeking behavior, um, the costs that are um the costs that are incurred, we look at the risks, we look at things like inflation, there's medical inflation, there's the current inflation rate of the country. We consider all that when you're coming up with this cost. And then now at the end of it all, we look at the sustainability because at the end of the day, you can have a fund, but is it really sustainable? Are we able to pay for all these benefits that we're seeing we're going to pay for? As Dr. Kohara is going to be presenting on SHIF especially, um, you'll notice that what had been presented before for validation is different to what is being presented now because you had to go back to the dream board and look at what do we expect to collect as a fund? Can we be able to pay for all these things? And then now we looked at all the benefits and had to do prioritization. So basically that's how we come in. We are the numbers people and people don't like us, but we, we are here to tell the truth. Thank you, Amina. Thank you. Uh, before I let you go, um, but we can keep engaging. Um, how? What's your input with the two point seven five? Like, uh, especially not just the two point seven five, but the fact that NHIF now is actually going to be a social insurance. There's no more management of um, the enhanced civil servants. There's no, there's no multiple schemes that are running. Uh, is that a good thing? And how how do you think it's going to have a positive impact? Do you, Are your current numbers crunching uh, positivity? Sorry, Amina, please come again. I missed I'm a bit of it. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm saying um, NHIF had multiple schemes, you know, the enhanced cover, uh, Linda Mama, Edu Afia, um, uh, indigent cover, I don't know, um, so many other uh, schemes that you're running that perhaps I'm not uh, exhausting them. Um, however, with SHA, it's more of, a, more of a social health insurance. How? What impact do you see it having uh, in terms of positive, in terms of negative? How are you seeing it from a numbers perspective? What are the trajectories? 
Okay, thank you, Amina. Um, as you rightly said, uh, for NHF, we had a lot of fragmented schemes in that we had um, what we were calling the national scheme, and then we had the enhanced schemes in the form of Edo Afia and the civil servant scheme. So what we're looking at right now is concentrating on one thing only, and that is becoming a social health insurance, which is positive. Um, we're looking at putting all our efforts to making this social health insurance scheme work. Now, instead of concentrating on also the enhanced schemes, which was more considered like it's a private side of NHF. It's basically offering private insurance the same way that you'd offer, that Jubilee would offer. But now for social health insurance, we're bringing all these things together and we're saying that now we'll only have one scheme. There's no fragmentation. Um, Linda Mama now is also part of SHIF and uh, Dr. Kora will be able to explain through the presentation. So we have all these schemes together and the whole point of having a social health insurance is bringing all the pools together. So once you, you've done your pooling, then that's a positive effect because they're looking at covering the whole population. And what, what was ailing in HF before is that we did not have the coverage, but now we're pushing towards having the coverage by having the mandatory contributions. And that will help us in terms of having a sustainable pool where we're looking at having the rich, having the poor, the sick, the young, the old, all of them mixing together so that you can have one big pool, which is sustainable and will do the cross subsidization across the different um, groups. So basically it's, it's a positive thing to have a social health insurance. Thank you, Amina. Yeah, sorry, Mati. Um, <clears throat> and then in terms of adverse, uh, yesterday, Dr. Kohoro had explained to us the adverse selection that was actually a stumbling block when it when it comes to especially voluntary membership. Uh, you had more of the chronic patients and patients who have illnesses that need to be sorted or they're paying for a specific surgical package. Once it's done, they stop paying. Um, do you... Uh, what are the what's your thinking process towards this? Do you think uh the sha the fact that now it's mandatory, the fact that uh it's more social, the fact that also we don't have a waiting period, uh will that will is that a good thing? Yeah, yes, Amina, that's definitely a good thing in that if we're looking at increasing the population that we're covering then it means that even the healthy will be mandated to pay for star. Now, as rightly so Dr. Kora said, currently we only have, especially for the voluntary members, it's only the sick who pay and they pay to seek a service. But now moving to Adsha where everyone is supposed to pay, it means that you're still gonna pay, even if you're healthy, then you, you still have to pay. So we won't have, we'll reduce the aspect of adverse selection, but this is only dependable on if we're able to have the entire population on board. So yes, um, adverse selection will definitely um, reduce with SHA. So we won't be experiencing um, what you were experiencing with any child. Thank you. Thank you too. Dr. Kuhara, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ari. Uh, thank you for joining. Sorry for the mishap that uh, you got. Um, uh, I don't know if, if there's a presentation, but if not, we can just go straight to the Q&A. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I will uh, just uh, do a bit of elaboration uh, based on yesterday's slides, mm -hmm. uh, how a patient basically transitions between the three funds with a focus on uh, secondary and tertiary care, because that's where the Social Health Insurance Fund and the Emergency Chronic and Critical Illness Fund kick in. So uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, just in terms of how it's been structured, and uh, that's what my colleague has mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, when it comes to the Social Health Insurance Fund, it's basically contributory. So it mirrors how NHIF has been financed uh, in this almost 60 years of its existence, where the resources are basically uh, drawn from member contributions. So that's where the funds from uh, the Social Health Insurance Fund comes from. Now, the contribution is at a rate of 2.75% uh, of uh, the household income. 
or when it comes to the formal sector, the ones who are in salary pay is 2.75% of the gross income. So that's uh, what has been proposed in terms of the contribution. And I explained yesterday that uh, presently within the formal sector, there is a significant variation in terms of the percentage of income that members contribute, where the lowest income earners are contributing 5%, the highest uh, income earners, were, that means the ones who are earning more than um, 100,000 on average are contributing about 1.12. Now, when you look at the informal sector, it's if the the impact is even significant because everybody contributes at 500 regardless of the income. So there are those ones who might be making uh, income pools of more than a million shillings, but they will contribute uh, 500 shillings. So that kind of uh, discrepancy is what a percentage uh, of the household income is uh, seeking to address. Now, when it comes to the... Um, population that is not able to afford, and just to give a, a, a bit of the breakdown, uh, from the data that uh, we were using, uh, I know it's been updated in 2024, the Economic Survey report has uh, slightly different figures. Up to 16% of the population is considered extremely poor. Therefore, we, we are expecting that uh, they will not be able to afford, even if um, it's uh, as cheap as it could get. So this is the population that will require full government subsidies uh, in terms of the government paying their premium so that they can be able to access uh, health care. Then uh, there is the, another pool up to 28% that is considered food poor. That means uh, this is the population that has to make a choice between uh, whether they are going to buy food or they're going to pay for their health care. Then there is another uh, 7% up to 35% who are considered to be earning uh, less than a dollar a day. So by standard definition, they will still be uh, considered poor. I think the presentation tomorrow that is looking at uh, means testing and now it's meant to work is going to give us some further breakdown on uh, how much is expected from them and what is being planned for the population that cannot be able to afford. Now, when it comes to the scope of cover and where it's being accessed, first of all, uh, being secondary uh, level of care, we are expecting that uh, this where uh, the level four, five, and sixes uh, would come in when it comes to the uh, uh, the referral framework. So um, that's where we are intending to buy the services from. And just as I mentioned, uh, because of the the issue around commodity security. Uh, that is uh, the farmer and the lab investigations or the uh, lab commodities. Uh, there's a provision that we've made that uh, over time we're going to make, um, we are going to recognize uh, standalone pharmacies and standalone labs of cell care providers and like what is there now. So that in instances where some services are not available, even at the hospital level, you can actually go with a prescription to this place and you can be able to access uh, the services or you can be able uh, to have some good level of sample networking so that even if uh, your point of care is maybe in Kisumu, but within that catchment, uh, you cannot access tumor markers. They can do the sampling, the sample networking to a lab in Nairobi or a reference lab in Nairobi that can be able to do that. But that is uh, one of the things that has been planned in the long term. Now, in terms of uh, the scope of cover that is expected uh, over time for uh, the SHIF, uh, we're expecting to cover outpatient services, but initially we are going to focus on the referred cases who are suffering from chronic conditions. So they are likely to be referrals uh, either because they need more specialized care or they've developed complications but still need to seek out patient services in a level four, five, and six. So we made a provision for that. Then two, um, as I mentioned yesterday, we are likely to have admissions. Uh, and uh, we are looking at a proportion of admissions of about 80% that are likely to go to level four, five, and six. Therefore, we'll be paying for admissions in those levels. Then uh, over time, uh based on fund maturity and the yield that you're getting we will seek to introduce dental services uh just as i mentioned these dental services are largely around um 
the basic dental services because the issues around maxillofacial surgeries, they are covered within the surgical benefit, which is provided for. Then uh, we'll cover the mental uh, mental health. And in this case, we've looked at two, two scenarios. There's the drug and substance abuse uh, rehabilitation and treatment. And then there are those uh, uh, psychological or addictive uh, psychological conditions, the likes of depression, the likes of psychosis that require admission, but not really in a drug and substance abuse rehabilitation center. So those have been factored in under, under shift. Then there is renal care services. I think this is one uh, of the areas where we've had to have significant deliberation because of the estimated costs that we are having. Now for renal care services, we are seeking to cover uh, dialysis. Uh, uh, that is hemodialysis uh, fully covered. Uh, then there is uh, hemodial filtration. There are a couple of facilities who have invested in the more advanced technology of hemodial filtration. Uh, so that is going to be covered, but not fully. Therefore, there's going to be an out-of-pocket element to it. And then there's also peritoneal dialysis. In the initial phases, we are going to cover part of the costs, about 50% of the costs. But over time, we are seeking to increase uh, uh, the coverage or in, in, uh, the amounts that we are taking up to, if possible, 100%. Now, when it comes to this uh, peritoneal dialysis, of course, we are going to have to have um, uh, an inclusion criteria because of the average estimated cost being at least 180,000. So we are, we are going to have to have uh, an inclusion criteria. And by the fact that uh, most of it is being done from home uh, with monthly visits, then uh, we are going to have to make sure that we liaise with the community health promoters as a way of monitoring uh, the patients. Then the other key thing that we are looking to cover here is on renal transplants. So initially we've been covering up to a limit that is a limit of uh, 450,000 for a transplant. And therefore any other additional costs are usually met uh, by the members except for enhanced schemes. Now, uh, moving forward, we are seeking to uh, increase the number of patients uh, who exit dialysis through kidney transplants. And because of that, we've enhanced the cover so that it covers uh, uh, the donor who is donating the kidney. It covers the procedure of tra transplanting to the recipient, and it also covers uh, the post-surgical uh, anti-rejection meds. So uh, that is a significant enhancement compared to what is there. And the main reason behind that is that when we look at uh, the returns data, the break-even point is about 32 to 33 months. And then uh, it is more sustainable to maintain the patients on the maintenance doses for anti-rejection meds as opposed to doing uh, dialysis. So it's, it's a lot more cheaper and it's uh, more uh, friendlier to the patients. And then when it comes to the survival rates, it's actually higher. So we've considered all those factors uh, in terms of introducing, uh, fully financing uh, the renal transplants. Then... Uh, uh, we are also covering um, deliveries, so this is both uh, normal, uh, the assisted normal, and also the, the cesarean sections. We are covering imaging, and in this we are looking at uh, MRIs and CT scans. And because of experience in terms of uh, overutilization, there's, there are also indications. It's limited to specific uh, indications. Then, uh, of course, there is oncology. It's one of the costly benefits at the moment. As, as I mentioned yesterday, it's one of the reasons why we are investing in uh, in screening so that we can be able to get these cases uh, early enough. Uh, so oncology will cover both uh, chemo and uh, uh, radio, plus other uh, advanced technologies that are presently there in the country uh, based on the indications. Then uh, there's the surgeries. It's one of the costly benefits, uh, but then this is also covered. Now, when it comes to the reimbursements, we have provided a list of surgical procedures, and each of them has a specific reimbursement to it. This is based on uh, some baseline costing that was done. And then we've also factored in that uh, there is medical inflation. 
So we've done an adjustment based on the medical inflation. And then the other bit is on uh, overseas treatment. So overseas treatment, there is a specific and more strict criteria on individuals who are accessing overseas treatment. And uh, one of the ways in which we are expecting this would help develop the internal technical capacity is that the providers overseas will be required to have um, uh, they will be required to have a contract or engagements with referral facilities in country. So this is meant to enhance several things. One is we can use telemedicine to do the patient reviews before they even travel because we've had instances where a patient travels, uh, they are terminally ill. By the time they get there, the situation worsens. And then we're having to pay for cargo, quote unquote, uh, that is uh, a diseased member coming back to the country. The other bit is because we felt uh, the local referral facilities can actually benefit through capacity development if we have this kind of engagements with providers uh, overseas. Uh, the third bit is because of care continuum. In most cases, uh, once a patient comes back into the country, the care continuum is lost. So they have to either maintain contact with the referral facility outside the country, or they end up having very different care uh, when they come back. So to ensure that care continuum so that there is value addition in terms of the monies that we are spending, that's the reason why we are seeking to directly engage and contract providers outside the country. And one of the requirements is that they need to have service level agreements with local referral hospitals. So that is basically the broad scope of cover when it comes to the shift. Now, the role of uh, emergency chronic and critical illness fund, uh, one is to cover for emergencies because it's actually a provision within the constitution that uh, Kenyans are entitled to emergency care, but the model of financing it has been the challenge. So NHIF had been covering for ambulance services, uh, interrupted at some point last year, but uh, it has been one of the benefits that has been offered. Now we are seeking to enhance this by covering both ground um, ambulance services, that is uh, road evacuation, uh, road ambulance services, and in areas where, uh, like for example, Lamu, which require some sort of uh, travel over water, that is also uh, catered for. Then uh, when the patient gets to the hospital, there is the accident emergency centers, otherwise referred to as casualties. So we are seeking to cover the 10 most common causes for emergencies within the first 24 hours. And these are catered for within the ECCF. Now for these two, being emergencies and being a constitutional requirement, it's uh, an entitlement to all Kenyans, regardless of the contribution status. So uh, as long as you have registered, or even if you've not registered, uh, there is an entitlement to that. So when it comes to the actuarial works, we've done a risk profile for the total population in the country. Now for the others, which are chronic and critical illnesses, it's based on a member who is contributing to SHIF and has exhausted the limits that have been provided under SHIF. For example, uh, I'll just use cancer management as one of the areas where we are seeking to have a significant investment under ECCIF. Uh, um, when it comes to cancer management, how we've been covering it is based on the number of sessions. So we look at uh, basic chemo, it's covered uh, up to a specific number of sessions. And then complex chemo, it's covered up to a specific number of sessions. So for a member whose treatment plan is more than six sessions of treatment, then the other sessions of treatment will have to be met out of pocket. And that presents a challenge because for members who could not afford it, then that means there's interrupted treatment. And when there's interrupted chemo treatment, uh, you are aware of the consequences. We are likely to present even worse or a relapse of something that had been controlled where the cost of management is even significantly higher. Now, how we are approaching it now is to implement uh, some discussion that we have had with uh, the stakeholders in the cancer uh, space, cancer treatment space, from the providers, the technocrats within the field, and even patient lobby groups. And we are seeking to cover the treatment plan. So uh, if the cost of the treatment plan is 800,000, then it's, uh, the limits for the patients are adjusted to that because we are seeking to achieve specific 
and desirable clinical outcomes. Now, uh, SHIFT provides up to a particular limit. And in this case, uh, we have a limit of 400,000, with 100,000 being in, uh, invested in uh, diagnostics, which has been one of the key challenges. So the likes of uh, immunohistochemistries, the tumor markers uh, will be provided for under that component of investigations. And then an additional 300,000 to cover for treatment. Now, if the treatment plan for this particular patient exceeds the 300,000, then the uh, ECCF comes in. So it complements or it supports uh, the patients in terms of that cover. So that is the eventual plan. But then for the rollout, we have limitations because of the budget allocations. So we intend to roll out with the emergencies first and then seek to increase uh, over time. So uh, the ECCF would be expected to cover the emergencies, as I mentioned, both uh, evacuations and treatment within the ANIS uh, units at the facilities. We are expecting that a number of oncology cases are likely to need uh, supplementary support through the ECCF. For the renal care services, we are also expecting that a number will require supplementation. For the mental health admissions and also for the drug and substance abuse, we are expecting part of that costs will be uh, part of those costs will be met uh, using the ECCF. Uh, there is a cover for assistive devices, especially for people who have uh, chronic. Now, we made a provision for that under shift because of some of the budget limitations, but over time, we expect most of those costs will be met under the ECCF. Then, of course, there are two other uh, areas under inpatient, so there is critical care. So part of the cost will be met under shift, and then uh, the rest of the cost will be met under ECCF once the fund matures. And then there is also palliative care. Now, for palliative care, we are approaching it in two ways. One, there are those patients who are retained within a care facility. Uh, and in this case, we are looking at both hospitals and the hospices. And then there are those patients who are uh, retained at home. So over time, we are going to seek to increase the coverage uh, for home-based services. But at the moment, uh, as I mentioned, it's a progressive thing. Eventually, we'll get there. But initially, we are going to cover it at the hospital-based uh, services. So that's what I have to mention about the two funds and how each of them interacts. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ray, for that uh, very comprehensive uh, peek. I, I, I love that the benefit has expanded and uh, the practicality. I'm sure Marcy, she mentioned that uh, they're the teams we don't like, eh? but I, I Massey Loki, I, I love you. Uh, but uh, I, I'm sure they're the ones giving the insight that it's too early to to give the critical. Let's do it one year. Let's push it for one year more. But I'm more interested in um in uh radiotherapy. Um, a lot of times, uh, in the clinical settings, we used to have patients who are asked to do maybe more sessions than what NHIF would have covered for. Have we increased the number of sessions or the number of sessions, if exceeded, would automatically go to emergency care fund? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, th that's what I've mentioned when it comes to the care plans. So we are looking at the care plans. We have been providing for 20 sessions and then any sessions after that, the member pays out of pocket or they use uh, any other cover that they might be having. Now, uh, moving forward, we have documents called the differentiated care uh, models for the most common cancers amongst children and amongst adults. And uh, we've used this to cost how much it takes to finance a whole course of treatment. So there are those patients who will require less than 20 sessions, but then there are those who require up to 30 sessions, especially the blood cancers. So we factored in all that. Now, the limit that will be absorbed within the member contributions, that is SHIF, uh, remains the same. But any other additional uh, sessions that will be required beyond that, uh, we intend to invoke the uh, ECCF. So that's the interaction between the two funds. Once you exhaust uh, your cover limits on one, 
then you automatically transition to the uh, government supported. The only condition except for accidents and emergencies is that you need to have active contribution within shift. Uh, over. Interesting. And um, the, the, there was something that I also wanted to ask in regards to the law. Uh, emergency care is a right for us. Also, when somebody has been sexually assaulted or um, violated in the case, it's also a right in the law for them to get medical advice. Is that within the cover? I, I think I missed it. Uh, yes, be because of uh, the constitutional provision when it comes to emergencies. That's the reason why we are focusing on the main reason for emergencies. We looked at the 10 most common reasons for emergencies, and that is what has been included in the cover. Over time, uh, once we get more data and uh, funds or the yields become more available, the scope of cover is going to change. But uh, in the initial phases, we are starting with that, and then we seek to increase over time. So the aspects around uh, cases of uh, gender-based violence, cases of stroke, uh, cases of uh, seizures, cases of trauma, major accidents, uh, because you know that's that's one of the main reasons why we have uh, cases in the emergency units. All those will be covered within the emergency, uh, the A and E, at least within the first 24 hours, with the main reason being evacuating the patients to get to a place where they will get the care and then uh, stabilizing and uh, uh, making sure that the patient, the patient is out of danger within the first 24 hours. Once that has been exhausted, then uh, a we are expecting that by that time, a decision will be made either to discharge the patient or to admit the patient or to go for more complex uh, procedures, either surgeries or something like that. So now uh, the, the shift comes in because it caters for, for those provisions. So that's that's the interaction between the two funds. Great. Uh, there are some questions regarding the packages. Um, has it been gazetted already, Doctor? Um, as at uh, this morning, I don't think it had been gazetted, but the, all the submissions have, have been made. Now it's just the process of uh, gazettement. But uh, that provision is there within the law that uh, it will be gazetted. Every Kenyan will be able to access what they are entitled to in terms of uh, the scope of cover and also the reimbursement amount. Ah, okay, perfect. Um, then uh, there, there seem to be a lot of questions regarding registration, uh, especially um, sort of a frustration uh, registering again. Uh, perhaps you can shed light on how the migration from NHIF to, to SHIF is being done. Okay, uh, thank you. I've actually noted that as I noted that yesterday as one of the key areas that we probably need to have some detailed discussion and probably bring in the uh, ICT team as well so that they can take through some live sessions on how the registration is done. So I would request that uh, we seek to have a session specifically for that. Uh, then, as I mentioned, there is that requirement of uh, registration uh, as a household. So the principal member registers and then declares the dependence within that household. So that's the provision that has been placed. But I noted the questions that have been raised in terms of uh, is it necessary or uh, transferring the data will, will need to be done. The individuals who indicated that uh, the process is a bit frustrating there, I think there's one question that was there that uh, uploading some of the documents required to declare dependence is a challenge. And then uh, there's also somebody who raised uh, about the complexities within the same process. So I would request mm -hmm. that uh, we share the details and probably provide uh, another session an with the digital health. Another team. session with the details on, uh, on how that is meant to be achieved. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for that. Uh, Masi, if you're still on, I would love you to um, address uh, this question. Um, before, and I think the people in NHIF, you knew that this existed. If if a person had uh, was a principal, the system somehow used to see them as an individual. And if they run out of their session, like let's say the 20... Uh, 
chemo radiotherapy sessions, they can be able to use another person as principal, another 20. Is that, how is that going to work with Shif? Uh, thank you, Amina. Um, as Dr. Kora was explaining, um, the way Shif is moving is that we are going to register the household. So you'll have the principal member who will then declare the dependent. And this other dependent could, let's say the wife could also be working. And previously in NHF, that person would have their own membership. But as it is now for Shif, um, it's going to be a household cover. So it, you won't be able now to move to the other card as was previously in NHF. So not just a household cover. Okay. Yes. Thank you uh, very much on that. Um, then another question, Dr. Kuhora, on um, dialysis. How many sessions is it? Is it two or three per week? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. We've uh, made a provision for two sessions of uh, dialysis uh, per week. And then uh, one monthly cover for the peritoneal dialysis because the hospital visit is expected once in a month. So that's uh, what has been provided for. But then we're expecting some additional resources will come in and any patient who would need the third session, that third session would be covered under uh, ECCF. But in the initial phases, we're going to start with two uh, because of the intricacies around the financing. Over. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, in in the same format, somebody is also asked about ICU. How is um ICU being covered? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, for ICU, uh, that is critical. That's what I mentioned about critical care, both ICU and HDU. Uh, we've used the data available across different facilities to run the estimates but then the current yield will not be able to support 100% reimbursement for critical care. So yes, it's one of the priority areas, but from the yield, uh, it's not possible to start by covering the whole of it. So what we are making a provision for is to cover part of it, and then the other uh, part, of, part of the costs are still going to be met out of pocket. But as the fund matures and more resources are available through tertiary, that is meant to expand, and we are seeking mm -hmm. to have uh, a significant proportion, which is a uh, hundred percent of the estimates. You know, one of one of the challenges about critical care is that it is patient centric. It depends on how that patient was actually managed. So we don't have a standard reimbursement for it, but we are seeking to cover a particular proportion, which is going to be uh, estimated. Uh, it's going to cover most of the patients who require that service. It's going to cover comprehensively for most of the patients who require that service. But we are still likely to have those outliers for patients who require some uh, significant additions during their critical care. But uh, the intention is to start from somewhere and then seek to increase uh, what is covered over time. Over. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, then in regards to elderly patients, I know we some uh, talked about it yesterday, but it's still a, re a repeated question. Uh, would you cover cancers, let's say, in a 70-year-old? Um, yes, we, we don't have segregations by age uh, or any of those factors. So that is still going to be covered. We don't have those limits when it comes to age. Of course, there are some proposals which have been made for procedures where when it comes to prioritization, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are looking at what funds are available. So when it comes to the optical cover, which is basically the refractive errors, we've started by people who or the uh, members who would be uh, school going up to 18 years. But over time, we will seek to enhance that. So uh, for packages such as uh, optical, We've put in that uh, age limit for now, but for others uh, like oncology and basically all the other services, we will not put in restrictions by age. Uh, over. Um, thank you. So 
no more uh, restriction in terms of age. Then in regards to the standalone labs and, uh, and imaging centers, um, A, there's somebody who was asking about what package do we have for the imaging. Uh, B, for the standalone labs, what are, what, what's going to be covered and how is it going to be covered? Okay, uh, thank you. For for the imaging, uh, it has been there. So we made a provisions for we've made provisions for MRIs, uh, based on the indication. We've also made provisions for CT scans based on the indications, and then for the ultrasounds, we've made a provision for the specialized ultrasounds, the likes of Dopplers. Now the rest are covered, yes, but within the inpatient and the outpatient benefit package, as as uh, I had explained. Now we've also made a provision for mammography. Uh, it has actually been there for the last two years, but uh, the utilization has been very low. So uh, probably some more uh, education uh, we, is going to enhance its utilization, but uh, the provision has been there since 2022 on coverage for mammographies. Then there's uh, the ECHOs uh, and uh, the EEGs, which have been provided for, and also fluoroscopy. So that's the scope of cover when it comes to the image. Wow. Uh, it's interesting regarding mammogram because I observed the same, uh, especially with the MES program. Uh, for some reason, we never use we never had enough uh, mammogram imaging uh, across the country in all the centers that they were put. And I don't know, is the education for the patient or the, for the healthcare providers? Because it's like, maybe, is it that requests don't come, Dr. Ari? I, I'm trying to understand. Is it that you don't get formal requests uh, asking for, um, for pre-authorization for mammogram? Um, yes, that has been the case. We are, we've actually gotten less than what we were projecting uh, as, uh, uh, well, there's somebody who has called them actuarists. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, uh, the, the actuaries within the fund would tell you, we had made estimates of how many uh, images we are likely to get per year when it comes to mammography so that we can estimate the budgets that we are likely to need. So mm -hmm. it fell short of what we had estimated mainly because the requests were not there. So yes, it's been there, but uh, the requests have been uh, low. Not that we are saying everybody should go and seek one. No, no, but then they, it's, definitely. It's a clinical evaluation that is needed before, and then a clinical justification is provided, a request is placed, and then uh, mm. it's approved for, for utilization. But it has been there. It's probably <laughs> the level of information or the suspicion index that has been low. And it's it's... Honestly, to be honest with you, it's quite surprising because breast is actually the most common cancer globally, not just in Kenya. And uh, it's not a matter of the machines were in there because that provision was there through the MES program. Um, maybe there were not enough radiographers to do mammography. I don't know, but it's actually a very... It's, it's something... This is not the first time I'm hearing. I'm just surprised it's it's something that also the fund you've noted you're making projections that are not um maybe it's a thought process if there's any surgeon in breast should look into uh if the education is actually um as clinical people not making the request or if patients are requested and they just decide i don't want that it's too invasive um but that's that's a good insight dr Ray. thank you um, then Edwin is asking questions on the level four. Um, you, I know you covered it yesterday, but I guess uh, repetition is always good. It makes us learn uh, things better. Uh, level four facilities are eligible for primary health care fund, or is it just limited to two and three? Um, and about the OPD service and the shift, does it mean that a patient cannot walk into level four or five? and access services without having been referred from level two and three. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you for that. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are some facilities, select facilities that are categorized at level four, 
that will be allowed to offer services, primary healthcare services, usually available at level two and three, and be reimbursed from the PHC fund. And as I ex explained, there are those intricacies around access that have informed uh, that decision. So in areas where access to a level two and three is a challenge, then that level four uh, will be considered and will be contracted to offer uh, services. And since all this information will be available on uh, the SHARE website, a member can be able to access. And uh, we are hoping, not, not really hoping, it's an exercise that has started, that uh, all providers uh, are geomapped and we are going to have uh, an app that is similar to what we have either with Google Maps or uh, other advanced geomapping technologies where you can actually go to the app and check the facility that is closest to you that has been contracted to offer this kind of service. And that is meant to address some of the challenges that were there. Uh, you remember the time of COVID where people will go around five, six hospitals looking for an ICU bed. So by having the geomapping and linking everything within an app, we'll be able to address uh, some of those uh, challenges. Uh, now, when it comes to working for uh, primary healthcare services at level sixes, um, as I mentioned, it's based on the referral framework. Uh, one of the reasons that has informed some of these decisions is to make sure that a referral framework actually works. So, uh, yes, you can still choose to go to a level five and six for primary care, but then the undertaking by the fund uh, is not going to be there. So it's either going to be met out of pocket or through a complementary insurance that uh, you might be having. Uh, over. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's a question I've been... Um... Uh, I've been trying not to ask, but I feel like it's key and uh, perhaps you're in a better position to to shed light on this. Um, the issue of uh, the court. Um, and somebody mentioned uh, uh, something like they went to NHIF um, to, to get their fingerprints by verification, but they were told that... Uh, the one is in court and they don't have directions on how to go about it. And it's a question that is recurrent featuring in terms of the unconstitutionality. The CEO had addressed it, but maybe you can expound on it. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I would actually love to expound on it. Unfortunately, I don't have a very legal mind because it's more <laughs> of a, a legal question. Yes. And uh, yes. I think uh, there was an, a meeting uh, in the morning with uh, the media and mm -hmm. the PS took time to elaborate on uh, on uh, what the situation is, uh, mm -hmm. what the demands by the court were, and uh, the stay orders that had been granted and what was being done during that period. So I might not be able to elaborate using the legal lingua, but... Uh, uh, yes, uh, the, there's some disc, uh, elaboration that has been provided by both uh, the PS this morning and the CEO in early yeah. sessions. Um, thank you. Masi, since I still have you on, um, somebody was asking in regards to um, Dr. Ari had mentioned telemedicine with overseas. Um, have we looked into having telemedicine just general as a package? Uh, thank you, Amina. Um, currently, for the next one year, we have not considered telemedicine, but um, we are definitely thinking about um, having that on board um, as we look at now expanding the benefits. And as we have said, the package is progressive, so we hope that in the future we'll be able to have telemedicine. But currently, we, it's not part of the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, I think um, then, sorry, there's this one question regarding uh, persons with disability and all the things that they have in terms of out-of-pocket expenditure. 
uh, going to see the physiotherapist, occupational therapist, uh, nutritionist. They, they, they seem to require a lot of um, uh, multidisciplinary teams. How are we? How are we factoring um, their unique circumstances and trying to make make them achieve the most benefit in this package? Okay. Uh, thank you for that. So I, I will start with what we have been able to achieve and uh, what is being planned moving forward. Um. When it comes to the reimbursements, uh, they will be entitled to all the other benefits, just like any other person. But then there are those specific uh, benefits that uh, they would be entitled to. An example is what I mentioned about the assistive devices. So we have a provision for wheelchairs, uh, for hearing aids, uh, for um, uh, uh, brace foots, uh, for walking crutches. But then for the ones who don't have permanent disability, it, uh, the reason why they need crutches is because of a surgical procedure or an orthopedic procedure, then it's covered for as part of the, the surgical uh, benefit. So that's one of the things that we'll be seeking to roll out. The other one, uh, we have call it rehabilitative services. So it focuses on the likes of uh, speech therapy, the ones who require physiotherapy. Uh, uh, we've not made provisions for some of them, like the hydrotherapy and the like, but over time, probably we are going to consider that. As I mentioned, depending on the funds that are available. So those are the provisions that we've made for now, uh, from as fast before introducing uh, some of the other benefits. Uh, over. Okay. Um, so sorry, let, let, let me try to so respond to yeah. Uh, yeah uh, let me try to respond to some of the fifty-five open questions. <laughs> yeah, there's one <laughs> in, about sickle cell. Um, uh, I know it's good news. I mean, I'd like to look at it from a positive perspective. Um, for the first time, we have outpatient cover for diabetic cardiac hypertensive patients. And um, unfortunately, uh, it's like one visit, the the benefit is up. Um, can you expand on that? Okay, uh, thank you. Yes, we had made a provision for the treatment plans, just like uh, cancer management. But the main challenge about that is because of the registries, as I mentioned, one of the key things that we're intending to do is to develop uh, the disease registries. And then two is the estimated costs. So based on the funds that are presently available, we intend to start by making a provision for a visit. But then over time, it's going to be expanded to at least one visit in a quarter. And then as we get more data and uh, some of uh, these deliverables become a bit more clearer, then it's going to be expanded further. But uh, initially we had made a provision for four visits in a year, that is one visit in a quarter, but uh, the cost implications were on the higher side and uh, the funds available could not be able to meet that. So in the process of rationalizing and optimizing, that's why it was uh, dropped uh, slightly as we get more data on it. Uh, over. Yeah, the, I think there were some questions that you had picked from the 54. Yes, so let, let me start with uh, Joyce Yuko. She's asking um, to ex to expound, not expand, on the, about the SLA. Um, uh, I think the perception that she got is that uh, facilities that lack some services will still provide the shift services as long as there's an SLA with a referral hospital. Now, what, what I mentioned about the SLA is for overseas treatment. So internally, the services that you're contracted for, you'll be expected to offer them. And if they're not offered at that particular point, then it's a violation of the contract because of either missed or incomplete treatment. But for facilities, uh, now for facilities that are locally uh, there, the provision for SLA is for dialysis centers, the standalone dialysis centers. And the reason for this is because 
based on clinical practice, there's a projection that there are some patients who might go into shock. So when we cost for dialysis, we are expecting these dialysis centers will have defibrillators because we made a provision within the cost that they need to provide for defibrillators. But then there are instances where that shock might not be adequately managed within the setting and they'll be required to be transferred to an ICU. So these standalone facilities offering dialysis, uh, there's a provision within their contracts that they need to have service level agreements with hospitals which have an ICU. So that in case of such an eventuality, it doesn't become an issue of a risk to that member. There is a provision in which this member can be able to access emergency services. Beyond that, the SLA is has been provided for or has been recommended for overseas treatment. So that when the patient, before the patient travels, a team of doctors on the other side and a team of doctors locally can be able to jointly review the patient and look at recommendations. And the main reason for this is because we've had instances where the course of treatment significantly changes once the patient goes out of the country. And it's something that could have been managed differently if there was that level of interaction between the overseas provider and the local referral hospital before the patient travels. The other bit is because of mortalities. We've had quite a number of cases where a patient is referred, but because of the evaluation has not been that good, and then we end up having a mortality overseas and the patient has to be transported back uh, in uh, what is usually referred to as uh, cargo. Then the third bit is because of the care continuum. We need to have that interaction between a local provider and an overseas provider so that even when the patient travels back into the country, there's some good level of care continuum uh, for this patient who had been initially managed uh, outside. Are we expecting some benefits? Yes, there's definitely going to be some good level of knowledge transfer between uh, the facilities which have more advanced uh, care protocols and our facilities, and that knowledge transfer is going to grow uh, the medical profession uh, within the country over time. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ari. I can see our time is almost up. Uh, there, there have been several questions on 2.75% uh, and um, also regarding the means testing. Tomorrow's session is going to cover that together with the means testing. So I'm looking forward to having that discussion with Kaboro from Ministry of Health. He's one of the senior economists from the Ministry of Health. I'm also hoping Dr. Ari can also join in and chip in and give us your wise uh, uh knowledge um, on, on the subject matter. Um, Masi, I hope you're still on. Uh, I like asking people to give us a parting shot in terms of, in summary, what do you think about this benefit and tariffs package? What, what was your experience going through it? And um, what's your parting shot? Dr. Kohara, maybe you can start. Okay, uh, thank you. I will start by responding to some of the questions that have flipped through. Uh, when it comes to hospitals, we'll engage all hospitals. And I think we, we need to look at private hospitals as complementing what the government is offering. So as long as the hospital uh, agrees to the terms of engagement and we have a contract with them, all hospitals, regardless of ownership, uh, will be uh, contracted. Of course, over time, uh, there is a strategic procurement protocol that gives details of service need so that we don't end up having a concentration of providers offering the same service within the same catchment. Then there are some areas of the country where there is no investment. So uh, there is a service need criteria that is based on the epidemiological factors. It's based on the risk factors within that population. It's based on uh, the numbers that we are seeing, both incidents and, uh, uh, and uh, the prevalence cases and the conditions that we are seeing. So over time, that is what is going to be used to determine whether we need to uh, buy uh, services from a provider or, or not. There are questions about who will be entitled to it. As I mentioned, primary health care, as long as you've registered, 
emergency within ECCF as long as you're a Kenyan or resident in the country. Then uh, uh, the social health insurance fund uh, benefits and the enhancements under ECCF as long as you are registered and a contributing uh, member under shift. So parting short is, um, I think we've tried to share as much as possible on what has been done. It's been a lengthy process. We've looked at quite a lot of data and studies, and we are hoping we are going to get to where the likes of Japan, which implemented or achieved UHC over the last 50 years. Uh, countries like Netherlands, where even setting up a hospital or being approved to set up a hospital is based on the service need. So you don't just invest. There's a reason why you invest. Even before you invest, that data is readily available. And then finally, uh, I think we have a lot of data and we need to seek to publish and speak more about what we are seeing about the healthcare and health financing trends. So it's one of the challenges or rather one of the things that we are taking up and we are hoping will be more visible when it comes to what is available, how the trends are changing and uh, what members would be entitled. Uh, thank you, Anko. Masi? Uh, thank you, Amina. I think my parting shot will just be to say that um, we've had, ever since this journey started, we have been working hard behind the scenes to ensure that we can give Kenyans um, the best that they can get. Um, as we keep on saying that this package is progressive, we hope that even as we continue and we achieve the aim that we hope to achieve, that we'll be able to give Kenyans the best package out there. So we continue to work together. We get the input, as Dr. Cora said, we have a lot of data. So the information is there. And as we move forward, we hope to give Kenyans a better cover. Thank you, Amina. Thank you too. And and today I'll I'll probably just give a parting shot myself. Honestly, let's ask Kumamograms. I'm I'm a bit worried about that. Um and just generally, um I believe Sha, especially moderating the sessions, Sha, Sha, Sha is, the spirit of Sha is good. Uh, having a social health insurance is what we need as a country, as opposed to running multiple schemes. We don't need another insurance. We need a social insurance that will get better. And we've had the benefit packages a lot better. And um, I'm hoping that with time, it will get better and better. Uh, and we are behind you, and uh, we wish you the best, uh, do uh, Dr. Kuhara and Masi. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we'll join in tomorrow and uh, hear what means testing, the famous means testing is. Good night. Good night, and thank you. Just try to make sure.